Okay, uh, in this video, I hope uh, we can make it uh, within 10 minutes, okay, uh, is to review uh, unit one very quickly. And there are 11 parts in this uh, unit one. So hopefully we can uh, just capture the main essence of each part. Okay, so first one, it's the uh, introduction of ecosystems. Uh, so there are different relationships. Everybody should be very familiar with these uh, relationships here, predator and prey relationship. And then we have neutralism, commensalism, and parasitism. Uh, the, the last three, they are known as symbiosis because they, are, uh, they have this close long-term interaction between these species. Uh, another main concept under this topic uh, is the, uh, the, the, the essence of competition. We have different kinds of competitions between species and within a single species. And, uh, and competitions are unavoidable. It's uh, part of the struggle. And, uh, and because of the competition, the individuals may uh, develop or not, well, may accidentally have these mutations. And we talk about evolutions. Um, these kind of uh, different adaptations may lead them to resource partitioning so that they will reduce the amount of competitions by becoming more unique uh, in their uh, niche. Okay, so they would avoid competition so that they can all live very happily. Okay, uh, section two, one point two, terrestrial biomes. Uh, so there are different biomes. Okay, the notable ones would be tropical rainforest, grassland, and uh, deserts, tundra. Uh, so key things are here. Uh, deserts. They are the most fragile biome because uh, in terms of uh, fragility, uh, we need uh, nutrient recycling to become a resilient ecosystem. But uh, if there's not enough warmth or not enough water, so uh, lacking each, uh, lacking either one of uh, these two will make it pretty fragile. So deserts will be the uh, the water. Uh, tropical tropical rainforest will be very very resilient, but but the soil will be very poor in nutrients because of this rapid. Uh, primary productivity, the uh, plants, vegetation just sucked up all the, so uh, all the nutrients in the soil. So that's also the reason why if we clear forest to build, uh, to have uh, to use for uh, agricultural purposes, uh, it is not going to be, uh, it's not going to be very uh, wise because the soil is so uh, uh, deficient in nutrients. Uh, grassland, uh, they do not have a high uh, primary productivity, uh, but they have this uh, high um, uh, amount of nutrients because the bacteria or the composers can degrade the uh, the degrade the dead organic matters in the uh, winter time and also in the summer time, and so uh, and without the uh, the huge rapid growth, the nutrients can stay in the soil. Okay, so that's part two. Uh, part three, aquatic biomes. We don't really need to know all the little parts, but uh, just make sure that you know these main parts of the freshwater ecosystem and the marine ecosystem. Uh, freshwater ones, I mean, they are pretty straightforward. And they're very important because they are providing us with uh, drinking water. Uh, the marine, we have different major parts of the uh, uh, biomes. We have the ocean, the open sea. Uh, we have coral reefs. They are a lot of biodiversity. Marshland, estuaries. Uh, they are right near the uh, uh, by the coast where the salt water and the fresh water they mingle each other uh, with each other. Uh, and uh, it's very important to uh, to acknowledge that uh, algae in the water they are responsible for or the plankton phytoplankton they are responsible for a lot of CO two storage and also making the O2 for our breathing. Okay, I mean, the uh, the tropical rainforest is very important, but in terms of the breathable O2, it's from the phytoplankton. Carbon cycle, uh, it's very important that you know all the carbon sinks listed on the left, the ocean, soil and plants, atmosphere, and fossil fuel in the rocks. Okay, uh, And the processes involving carbon will be photosynthesis, Okay, uh, respiration. Every single living organism will uh, carry out respiration. That's how we uh, extract energy. Uh, and then we have uh, burning of fossil fuel, and this is going to be a key one because uh, it takes millions of years to deposit the carbon into solid form <coughs> into the rocks. But uh, in a matter of seconds, we can put those uh, uh, 
uh, there's a high density of carbon back into the atmosphere. So the burning of fossil fuel, it's going to be a repeated theme uh, over and over again throughout this course. Uh, nitrogen cycle, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, it's very important that you know all the processes, the name of the processes, and, and the fact that humans are messing up right here, the nitrates, because of the inorganic fertilizers. Okay, Inorganic fertilizers are rich in nitrate, and it will cause uh, eutrophication and also uh, pollution. Okay, So key thing right here. Uh, 1.6 phosphorus cycle. Uh, phosphorus cycle is very unique. Uh, it's not in, again, any kind of gaseous form. It's a limiting factor. Uh, plants need it for growth. And uh, we will use phosphate. Uh, we, we will also want to put phosphate into the uh, fertilizers. Well, how can we do that if it's a limiting factor? Well, it's mostly in the rocks. So we will use mining to extract the phosphorus or phosphate from the rocks to make fertilizers. So, uh, so that's also uh, a little uh, foreshadowing to our future topic on mining. Uh, 1.7, uh, water cycle. Uh, I think this is very um, uh, it's old knowledge. We learned this uh, from before, uh, but uh, the key things here uh, would be the human activities. How do we influence the uh, for example, the runoff. We put concrete on the ground so that it blocks the water from, from infiltration. So there will be increasing surface runoff and also pollution, of course. And because we block the infiltration, we limit the groundwater supply. And also we're taking too much water from the ground for agriculture. Okay, And then we have shifting climate patterns. So uh, we have shifting rain patterns, snowing pattern. Uh, so places that were uh, pretty humid, wet before, now it becomes dry and vice versa. Okay, uh, Primary productivity. Primary productivity, it's uh, the key thing right here. It's to know uh, the places, the biomes that have the highest net primary productivity, such as coral reefs, tropical rainforest, wetlands, estuaries, and temperate forest. Okay, so chances are you might be asked to pick one of the biomes with the highest net primary productivity in a multiple choice. Uh, so what is net primary productivity? It's when you have the gross primary productivity that is from photosynthesis. And then you have to minus the respiration because of the, uh, the energy used for respiration. Okay, so, uh, so that's how you get the net primary productivity. When we talk about trophic levels and uh, energy flow, Okay, it's very important that we know the producers, primary consumers, uh, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And uh, we have one more name uh, that's not printed here. It's when we have primary consumers, they are also known as the herbivores. Herbivores, they eat the vegetations. Um, all energy comes from the sun. And uh, now, usually, they just ask about the 10% from uh, one trophic level to another. OK, uh, it's not very frequent that they talk about the sun's energy then to the producers. But if it does happen, OK, if it does happen, just keep that in mind that the sun's energy is only transferred at one percent rate to the producers. And afterwards, for every single trophic level, it's going to be like a 10 percent transfer and 90 percent, 90 percent will be lost to heat. OK, and that's also related to the second law of thermodynamics. And the last section right here, foot chains and foot webs, okay? Uh, foot chain, it's about, well, you can see right here, that's a foot chain, just a linear relationship. You have the sun, you have the uh, producers, you have the primary consumer or the herbivores, and then you have the secondary, tertiary, and then you have the top predator, okay? Uh, when you have a foot web, then you have this uh, multi, uh, you have multiple chains linked together as a web. Now, uh, as we will talk about in population later on, uh, it's very important to know that how the disappearance of maybe a species right here, okay, will lead to the uh, the population of other species. For example, if the owls are gone, okay, so it might lead to the increase of frog, okay. For example, uh, or if we say the grasshoppers are gone, then uh, the amount of uh, frogs and the birds will drop as a result. Okay, so uh, 
so this is why it is very important to know uh, these uh, webs, okay? And, uh, and we have in the middle, we have positive feedback and negative feedback loops right here in the middle. So the key thing right here about positive feedback loop is that the input will carry out with the process to become the output. And the output becomes the input again. So this cycle just goes on and on and on, and then it gets more uh, vigorous, okay? Uh, intensity becomes higher, such as uh, global warming. We have a warmer ocean, warmer, o warmer ocean, and then we have uh, melting sea ice, and the melting sea ice leads to uh, less uh, solar radiation reflected back to the uh, back to the space, and therefore uh, it becomes uh, even more uh, warm in the ocean. Whereas uh, negative feedback, it's a uh, regulating. Uh, it's a regulating. Uh, it's a regulating um, uh, mechanism, okay? Uh, because uh, just like our body temperature, uh, if it gets too hot, we will sweat. So this one is about regulation, and uh, it's difficult to have a. Uh, it is difficult to have a negative feedback loop because energy is required as a result. Okay, so uh, again, our body will be a good example of negative feedback loop.